Thank you so very much to curator and director of the Van Nevery Smith Gallery's Leah Newman for both inviting me to participate in and providing so much support to mount this layered solo exhibition in three galleries. I'm grateful to have Elisa Pichamarn Alexander's essay, Future Pictures from the Yellow Pages of History, included in the exhibition catalog and in context to my practice. Pichamarn Alexander is Assistant Curator of American Art and Co-Director of the Asian American Initiative at the Cancer Arts Center at Stanford University. Lastly, thank you to Hong An Jung, friend, colleague, and collaborator. Hong An's conceptual practice often mines archives of our material past to expose visual genealogies that agitate positions of power. The artist works in video, photography, performance, and installation. Our collaboration entitled The Sky is Not Sacred in both video and painting is included in the show. The solo exhibition is a really significant marker in my practice, putting together four bodies of work created in the last few years in dialogue with one another. Much of this work responds to modes of landscape and narrative. I'm interested in how each has been integral to the other in the creation of visual mythologies of the American narrative. Who is centered in that narrative? and the bodies kept in the periphery. In his book, Imperial Landscapes, John Crowley advocates a need to consider landscape painting as a fictitious and constructed space. Thomas Jefferson, in his notes on the state of Virginia, called on American landscapes to be viewed through the lens of British aesthetic theory. In this painting of Thomas Hearns, we see his representation of Britain's sugar plantation colonies. The landscape is represented as peaceful, the empire's subjects through the eyes of the colonizer. Linear and atmospheric perspective create a vast colonized space. And in the foreground, completing Hearn's account of the social hierarchy, lies the stereotyped depictions of the indolent and colonized population. With the establishment of Yellowstone National Park in 1871 in Northwestern Wyoming, painter Thomas Moran was commissioned to create the symbolic painting. This work helped institutionalize an aesthetic way of viewing Yellowstone, national parks, and perhaps our very landscape that endures today. Drawn from European aesthetic conventions of romanticism, the painting is imbued and imbues nature with spiritual and nationalistic meaning. Possessing and depicting such places was closely linked with national pride and religious belief in the U.S. during the 19th century. In the middle of the painting, Euro-American explorer gestures an outstretched hand to the vast sublime landscape as if laying claim to it. Native and Native American figure with his back turned walks away from its glory. Here, Moran asserts Euro-American possession of the landscape and gives visual representation to landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted's observation. The power of scenery to affect men is, in a large way, proportionate to the degree of their civilization and to the degree in which their taste has been cultivated. Here, language and painting are essential to settler colonialism and the terrible force of manifest destiny. As a refugee who came from a land with colonized history, I'm mindful of the representation of our landscape with its own colonized history, such as the Kataba tribal land we are standing on today. Where the lineage of the sublime in American landscape painting was found in artistic interpretations of nature and God, beyond its borders, uncannily mimetic scenes of the sublime are enacted through the hands of the military. This, this photograph is actually quite famous, although you may not recognize it. It's also known by the general um, media name of Napong Girl. So in this photograph um, is a scene during the American campaign in Vietnam of Napong bombs falling on the landscape and people running towards the camera, including, including a nude young child. Stanley Carnell's book, in Stanley Carnell's book, Vietnam and History, he draws the connections between Walt Whitman, whose poetry calls for America exporting its happiness and liberty to the ancient cultures of Asia, to Kennedy and Johnson, who were influenced by Whitman's ideologies in considering action in Vietnam. 
leading up to the American military campaign in Vietnam, Vietnam was colonized for about 2,000 years by China and France. In his struggle for independence, Ho Chi Minh wrote the US for aid for decades, starting with Woodrow Wilson to help throw France out of the country. Ho actually admired American governance, and he even cited Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence in his own Declaration of Vietnamese Independence from France in 1945. The US ultimately backed French colonization in 1950, pursuing military action in Vietnam under the intention to contain communism. And here the perceptible link continues between political ideologies and the formation of an aesthetic. Consider the inception of American abstract expressionism, coinciding with Japanese and American internment during World War II from 1942 to 1945. A group of predominantly white male artists in New York known as the club soon after, from 1949 to 1955, met to discuss important concepts that influenced their work, such as the concept of Zen in Japan. Within these groups of artists, Ad Reinhardt heavily researched Chinese painting and then created a whole series of black paintings that were interpreting the concept of the Chinese void. Franz Klein and Marita Shiru entered into correspondence in the 1950s to share their love for Japanese calligraphy. Klein also wrote directly to another artist, Saburo Hesagawa, about his love for older painters of Japan and China. In Hyperallergic, the writer Daniel Wu reviewed a show called Abstract Expressionism, Looking East from Far West at the Honolulu Museum of Art. She writes, art critic Clement Greenberg opposed the perceptible link between abex and Asian discourse. In 1955, he wrote, not one of the original abstract expressionists, least of all Klein, has felt more than a cursory interest in oriental art. The sources of the art lie entirely in the West. Not only was this xenophobic statement untrue, examples of this thinking likely contributed to the erasure of Asian American abstract expressionist artists like George Miyazaki and Bernice Bing. And abex became an almost purely white male genre. The CIA also promoted American modern artists for about 20 years, using them as a cultural weapon in the Cold War, pitting free artistic expression of individual practices that really were part of the abex um, individual artistic practice, opposite Soviet socialist realism, which perpetuated communist values. The movement became monumental, and here's an example where the artist Roy Lichtenstein created a body of work which responded to the abex movement. Lichtenstein's brushwork series became a parody of American abstract expressionism. Since World War II, the U.S. has bombed at least 33 countries on public record. Only one, Yugoslavia, isn't in the region's countries deemed by the collective East in the book or Orientalism by Edward Said. So what I've done here is I've, I've sourced the images of the location year of the bombing. And I paint those bomb landscapes in rom the romanticized aesthetic of early American landscape painting through a window of one of Lichtenstein's brushstroke shapes. The concept I'm, I'm calling from is known as translatio imperii. It's an antiquated idea that civilization is always carried forward by a single dominant power, and that historical succession was a matter of outward movement. In these works, I'm also interrogating mainly the idea of the sky as a sacred place in painting. During the American military campaign in Vietnam, American General William Westmoreland stated of the region, there are Asians who don't think about death the way that we do. America ended up dropping more bombs in Laos than the entirety of Europe during World War II, it, making it the most heavily bombed country in the world history, and a good portion of this done covertly by the CIA. 80 million of those bombs did not detonate upon contact and have killed or maimed at least 50,000 people since the war ended. The current US military campaign in Afghanistan, which is, has ended, or is ending, began on September 26, 2001, 15 days after attacks on the Twin Towers on September 11th. The paintings confront the creation of a canon in American painting, with the lens that has affected military dominance, 
in the world. British landscape painter John Constable in the early 19th century stated, in art there are two modes by which men endeavor to attain the same end and seek distinction. In the one, the artist, intent only on the study of departed excellence or on what others have accomplished, becomes an imitator of their works, or he selects and combines their various beauties. In the other, he seeks perfection at its primitive source, nature. Constable began in 1821 to um, create a very distinct painting practice that, were, that was really made from Keane's observations of the sky and clouds. B. Novak in Nature and Culture on discussion of 19th century American landscape painters and also British painters in the first half of the 19th century writes, the sky is a finely tuned paradigm of the alliance between art and science. In that mutable void, the landscape artist concerns, poetic, ideal, and symbolic, empirical, and scientific, were sharpened rather than blurred. As a source of light, spiritual as well as secular, the sky relieved absolutism with infinite moods, unchanging ideals with endless process. No wonder the artists fixed their particular attention on those moist cargoes that describe the void in brief but repeated compositions. Clouds. So um, I, I started a project with Hong Wan Jung, and we collaborated on, um, on a piece known as The Sky is Not Sacred. And in that piece, we focus on a declassified military operation called Operation Popeye. And this is when the US military used weather modification in Southeast Asia as a weapon. Planes dropped seeding agent into clouds, initiated rainfall, and extended the monsoon season, making vehicular travel impossible over the terrain. So on the, on the left, you see a diagram of, of a de the declassified document that shows the different stages of clouds. And on the right, um, we have a cold um, narrative writing from John Constable that really illuminates and talks about the emergence of clouds in his practice in the early 19th century. The sun's rays warming first the surface of the earth and their radiation causing warmth to be propagated upward, this warmth converts water to the Earth's surface into vapor, which rises and exerts its electrical force on that which the nocturnal decrease of temperature has not decomposed, and which therefore remains diffused. The latter, in passing through the atmosphere to give place to that from below, changes its climate, arrives in colder air, and is therefore decomposed and thrown into a, visible, a state of visible cloud. So this is one of the pieces that you will see in the exhibition. This is a large triptych painting um, in which three stages of, of Operation Popeye are painted in a lurid red hue. The, the cloud stages emerge in a vast landscape. We're using hard edges, structure, and a candy color to agitate natural observations between sky and water. In the video footage that, that you will see also, and I'm going to share a clip right now, um, the video footage is from the US National Archives, airstrikes from 1967 in Vietnam, with a narrative called from writings by John Constable and read by an actor. Constable's text professes an authentic reverence to the sky, suggesting the idealization of nature and science as an aesthetic epistemology. The piece asserts the way in which Western ideologies have violently impacted the Vietnamese landscape shaped our cultural and emotional relationship to landscape, and shaped our cultural and emotional land relationship to landscape as an imaginary space. So I'm gonna just do something real quick here and escape out of that. Hopefully this works, okay. And then let me just play about a minute or so of the video here. Hopefully this will work. Uh-oh. Project of this is grand in itself. So that no kind of the subject of this is grand in itself. So that no kind of effect could be introduced too striking or too impressive to portray it. And among the various appearances of the elements, we naturally look to the grander phenomena of nature. Sudden and abrupt appearances of light, thunderclouds, wild autumnal evenings, solemn and shadowy twilight. 
variously tinted clouds, dark, cold, gray, or ruddy and bright, with transitory gleams of light to heighten, if possible, the sentiment which belongs to a subject so awful and impressive. The sky is the source of light in nature and governs everything. So in continuing now, I'm, I'm going to speak about my, um, my paintings that really focus on narrative and allegory. And I want to share two texts that have been really important to um, shaping the way I'm thinking about my work. The first is Edward Said's or Orientalism, which is the foundational text in the field of post-colonial studies. And this, this uh, text is very dense, but there's definitely just three main focuses, uh, focus. Um, ideas that Saeed uh, speaks of, that writes about, and really expands upon that I'm, I'm interested in. The first is that the definitions of these have changed throughout history, meaning Africa, the Middle East, and or Asia, and how the, the cultural and political misrepresentations of these places are created in the West, and how artifacts of cultural heritage, and that in their inputting, for instance, paintings, monuments, are made and how these misrepresentations perpetuate hegemony that continue to permeate our belief systems. The second is a more current text, Anne and Lin Cheng's Ornamentalism. And this text gives historical context to the creation of the Asian woman and, as an aesthetic being and how modernism has dismissed the ornament as surface and aesthetic. <clears throat> this, is all, this is an example of um, a painting from the genre of Ori Orientalist painting. And it's, it's um, French Orientalism from the painter Jean Auguste Dominique Anne. An example, um, through this genre, a lot of paintings showed depictions of the odalisk, the harem, and the concubine. But these were, were fictitious mis misrepresentations created by and for the Western male imagination. But in 19th century America, it was not nude bodies, but cloth used to portray Asian women as sexualized. In the case of 22 Lu Chinese women, which went all the way up to the Supreme Court, it began in 1874 when the American steamer named SS Japan, carrying almost 100 passengers from China, docked in the San Francisco Harbor. California Commissioner of Immigration, himself an immigrant from Poland, denied permission to 22 women ages 17 to 22 from disembarking. He cited they were lewd. The case went all the way up to the US Supreme Court, who eventually ruled in the women's favor. Testimonies from mostly white men who used the women's clothing and ornament to make inferences that they were prostitutes, set in colorful of clothing, ornaments, and headdress. Skin, cloth, or an ornament can only become interrelated metaphors for personhood when actual personhood is denied. In Elisa Pitcher Marne Alexander's essay, she writes, for both the artist and this writer, she is Thai American, traditional Southeast Asian textiles hold special places in memories of our upbringings. Deeply saturated silk patterns and glittering gold threads reminds us of our grandmothers, mothers, and special occasions during which such textiles were worn and displayed. While such fabrics were used against our Asian American women ancestors, Trong's painting provides a space for the diasporic descendants of these women to luxuriate in the intergenerational beauty of this important textile history. So one of the things that I think of, and I don't have an image of it, is um, growing up here, um, there was there's a, a mode of dress called the Aoyai, and the Aoyai is this you know, high-necked, long, 
silk dress that's worn with also really long silk pants that we wore a lot during um, weddings and special family gatherings. And that, that it was, is pretty common in my generation, you know, of, of, of a Vietnamese refugee and is still worn and adopted today. But my own family has its own history too of, of textile. And this right here is embroidered linen from my, my father's family. So my father was a third generation business of, of embroidery, which was housed in Hanoi. During French colonization in Vietnam, the family lost their house in the building and they moved everything, including family and employees in 1940 to Saigon, where we had more relatives and support system. During the fall of Saigon in 1975, our family could not take any of the embroideries. And we, we actually received these because in the 1980s, they were shipped to one of my aunts in France. And then relatives in the US were able to go to France and retrieve them for us. And I wanted, so I wanted to bark on nervous about the complication of global transnational identities. And a lot of ways in which I think about this is the complexity of, of the American identity, for instance. Um, I'm responding to the issues of historic figural representation with, within the imperialist orientalist landscapes also that I've been showing you. So in, in doing so, I actually turned to the world textile trade, which itself is a narrative of migration and hierarchy and power. So we see here painted silk from Asia adorning the bodies of high society in France, Britain, and America. And on the left, we see an, an image of French, French textile from the late 18th century that was traded for import into Africa for enslaved people. Pichamar and Alexander writes, historically, these source textiles circulated throughout the Western world, literally laying the mythologies of empire upon white bodies in the form of clothing, furniture, and household items. The scenic textiles that were also you know, made into cloth, draped, made into sofas and wallpaper, and also clothing, also perpetuated these supremacist narratives. An example of this, is 18th, 18th century textile, which shows how Europeans in that time commonly personified the Americas as an exotic native woman. And this textile in particular shows Spain's dominance in its colonies. Textiles also show perceived representations of culture and how this also changes through cultural contact, complicated by cultural signifiers of identity that are born from endless border crossings from colonialism, war, and political and social conflict. In the 1940s, scholar Fernando Ortiz put forth a concept of transculturalization as a new political theory of cultural contact, one that did not define itself only in oppositional relation to the histories of colonial dominion. In this intermingling of different peoples and cultures, new cultural phenomena are born. So in these works, I'm abandoning traditional figuration. I'm representing the figures through gesture of my hand and body, and I'm adorning these gestures with painted textile designs from a specific time and place and region as a type of patriotic uniform. I was really interested in the painting tenet, the Asian painting tenet, to try to capture the essence of a subject and not simply to represent it. Here, I'm really considering and focusing on the essence of assimilation and the erasure of birth in the creation of new transnational identities. I also began to use silk and linen in my work, um, actually the physical silk and linen in my work. They are the supports of the, found, they are basically the foundational supports of various historical painting found in traditions and methods out of Europe, the Americas, and Asia. It was also a way to reference the silk roads, which the Silk Roads were actually the first location of cultural, and religious, and material exchange between the East and the West and the Mediterranean and China. This is the last of that series, and it became more personal. Here, I'm using textile designs from, the, from 18th century America, Southeast Asian, and Sioux Nation. My status as a refugee from Vietnam, a country colonized for centuries, and, Amer and then and as an American, a country founded on the colonization and genocide of indigenous tribes. In the upper corner, I also have, it's, it's really tiny, you can't see in the upper left-hand corner, I have an interpretation of Thomas Beersat's Yosemite, an early American landscape, um, and Beersat was also part of the Hudson River Valley School. 
So in this next work, I'm focusing on, on a series of works from Thomas Cole, one of the founders of the Hudson River Valley School. Cole was an English immigrant. He was an environmentalist. He was not an imperialist. Within this work, we see, so this is just four of the works. So this is a series of paintings called The Course of Empire. And I'm just showing you four here, but there's actually five. But, but within this work, we see um, the lineage of, of, of British aesthetic landscape theory. We see romanticism. We see allegory on the bot and the two bottom um, pieces. In Cole's empire, more or less like narratives show the rise of civilization from a savage state to its fall. So in my recreation of the five paintings, you know, it, it, I was really interested in rewriting the work. Um, so I wanted to create a painted narratives that also engage in a syncretic blending. So one of the concepts I was really focusing on was Chinese shifting perspective. And it's a philosophy that breaks free from the restrictions of time and place and focuses on the idea that perspective is mobile and in flux. I also wanted to work against the romanticized aesthetic of American British landscape painting. And so I drew inspiration from the compositions of Japanese war prints. And this is the first of the series. In the work, I'm revising Cole's Empire, um, and I'm creating a narrative that examines the political conditions embodied in the America's founding agrarian philosophies as a nation built from colonization, diverse immigrant groups, and enslaved persons. The work becomes a frenetic amalgamation of American and Asian painting techniques, materials, and philosophies. And in that, I'm searching for a form that mirrors my own experience, but I'm also testing out the art historical hierarchies assigned to such cultural forms. The Devil's Tower is a mountain on the upper right there. In Cole's work, in each of his five works, he has a mountain as, a sim as symbolism. Devil's Tower was, in 1906, became America's first national monument and named by Theodore Roosevelt. It's a sacred site to indigenous tribes, and, and those tribes have tried for decades to get the name overturned and changed without, without any um, progress. And within, so, so here you see there's, so on the right, there's a gestural, all, all that is oil painting, there's gestural painting. There's also references to sword painting. Um, the, the yellow cloth, I know it's kind of washed out here, but I am interested in also the mythologies that are built through painting. And, um, and so that cloth is actually a painting that was painted by the Spanish painter de Veria 400 years after Columbus as a way to glorify Columbus's cultural contact. And within here, um, I'm focusing on sites and narratives that have been crucial to the American narrative. So on the left, um, as a site of protest, is the Dakota Pipeline landscape. And then within the, so these here, it's hard to see on the slide, but they're actually silk paintings I've painted, cut up, and then they're actually little fractured pieces that are actually hanging from the top of the painting. So when one walks by the paintings, the, the silk actually moves. And here's a close up of a, a place um, on the painting where you see of the oil paint and the hand painted silk. So the oil paint at times is also very thick and gestural and then the hand painted silk is again falling in those layers. So French philosopher Michel Foucault defines his concept of heterotropias as a non-hegemonic space of otherness, which simultaneously mirrors, distorts, and inverts other spaces within a culture. According to his third principle of heterotopia, it's capable of juxtaposing, in a single space, several real spaces and sites that are in themselves incompatible and foreign to one another. Foucault gives an example of the ancient garden in the Orient as a heterotopia representing a microcosm of diverse environments. So this painting is, is recontextualizing um, Thomas Cole's Arcadian state. And for Thomas Cole's Arcadian state, he has a man in the landscape taking a stick and drawing in the, in the ground as a, as a marker of civilization. So for this work, on the upper left, there is Monticello, Thomas Jefferson's home, one of our founding fathers, built on a mountain by his enslaved persons. There's also a representation of the Dismal Swamp, 
which is a location between North Carolina and Virginia that slaves and the Maroon people and Seminole Nation escaped to. I also find in my own work it's important to, to um, capture moments of our own experience in our lifetime. And so within here there's also um, gestures that are an ode to the act of recent activism that had taken place in Durham and Chapel Hill in North Carolina of the taking down of the Confederate monuments. So in Cole's destruction, um, I focus on the plight during World War II of, um, of Japanese Americans. And this, at this time, the government confiscated the homes, businesses, and belongings of about 120,000 of their citizens and put them in internment camps in the desert. This was deemed by the government for their own safety in 1942 and 1946, from 1942 to 1946. I, I didn't write down the name of the person who, the architect of this idea, but actually originally the architect, because of World War II, also proposed that um, Italian Americans and German, German Americans were also interned, but that did not take ground. These ideas tap into the antiquated yellow parallel racist ideologies within this work used far back in history, for instance, to encourage European empires to invade and colonize China, and also in 499 BC between ancient Greece and the Persian Empire. So in this work, I, um, I see it as a time where America destroys itself. On the top there, the mountain is actually the bomb cloud of Hiroshima. And on the bottom, we see the Manzanar um, internment camp depicted right in the middle bottom there. So in this work, I'm also starting to reference real Asian American historical figures. And so fractured on the bottom left is actually a fractured silk painting of Fred Korematsu, who was a Japanese American who refused to enter the internment camps. And his case went all the way to the Supreme Court, who eventually ruled against him. And here are just some installation shots. Um, I. I, I had a solo show at Gallery Quinn in Vietnam, which showed um, the Mutiny in the Garden series and also the, the Little Bond Landscapes, the translation of Harry I series. So here, you know, just to see a close up um, of all the techniques and imagery that I'm using. So we have a, like a, a representation of the statue of U Ulysses S. Grant, the Asian president of the US. Um, we, I'm also painting Mexican mid-century oil cloth, some Turkish design. And I also, there's little pieces of linen cut into brushstroke shapes. And within those um, linen pieces, linen also being really historical to, um, to, paint, to painting history as support, have textile design actually laser cut onto it. So in the current work that is new, which I have several new, new um, pieces that are in the gallery that we can see after the talk, um, this is a series called From the Earth Rise Radiant Beings. And in this work, I'm actually taking figures from historic or against less paintings. Again, these figures were sex overly sexualized and submissive within their gestures you know, painted to fulfill the Western imagination. In my work, I'm recasting them. I'm painting them in the palest yellow hue and as silhouettes rejecting their sexualized and submissive origins. In my own work, they're given agency. The figures are weaponized and they're also engaging in acts of self-love. I refer to the historic paintings created for and by the, the Western male lens as a way to talk about the history. Um, that they have, that they're basically in the canon, that the impact that they've had. I'm also starting to, you know, again, paint um, some figures that are really pertinent to Asian American history. And on here, in two different panels, we see Anna Mae Wong, who was um, an early silent American, and then, um, and then I think speaking film star. So within the use of these Orientalist figures, I'm referring, referring to the genre of, of Orientalist painting as artifacts of cultural history, which also perpetuated myths of supremacy, which enacted legacies of generational trauma. And here's just a close up. 
And this piece is actually in the gallery. I'm building bodies out of silk printed with textile designs. And we see that what I'm talking about right now are the, the sort of red shapes, um, the kind of red anamorphic shapes. Bodies emerge out of the, the, the anamorphic shapes created from historical violence, cradled by the uncanny silhouettes. The narratives created from painted bond landscapes or orientalist figures and also iterations of textile. They refer to and reject these oppressive epistemologies, creating narratives of resistance, strength, and love passed down from our actual ancestors. Centered is Teresa Mangabuana e Faris, who led troops into battle and resisted colonialism in the Philippines against Spain, the United States, and Japan. And you can see it better in person, but she's right there, right in the middle of the painting in a greenish yellow hue. In this, these works, I, in my mind, I'm creating a type of Asian futurism, one that considers the actual violent histories that emerge from these Orientalist ideologies, and the trauma that has been absorbed generationally to transcend geographically and through transnational experience to create narratives of resistance and autonomy. And that's it. <laughs>